This is the session on active surveillance in neuro-oncology rationale risks and outcomes. I'm Lori Klotz, Ellie Rosenbaum, who's a medical oncologist. And uh, the first speaker is Mark Solway, the need for resection of TAG1 tumors. And the way this session is structured, we're going to cover the whole spectrum, bladder, kidney, prostate, and non-urological malignancy. So it, it should be very interesting and lots of areas for discussion. Mark, well, just while we're getting ready, Mark, as far as I know, has really been the major proponent of so-called surveillance for bladder cancer. In fact, I'm not sure anyone else has actually seriously proposed this besides well, you. Well, we'll so change their mind now, I, I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let me just start thanking uh, Kobe publicly and Lori for all the work starting two years ago to do this. It was a major initiative and the meeting is growing and I mean it's really a highlight and it's, it's great to be here. And the non-urology speakers have been so far three out of three fantastic. I don't know who this is but uh, it goes back a few years. Uh, this I think may have been my first time here. Looks like some guy rock star to sort of. And I just want to say a little bit of one word of philosophy. And I hope you take it the right way. This is my very first fellow, and the Israelis know him, Yisrael Nissenkorn. And the message is just to cherish every day. As doctors, we know that life is fragile. But this year has been a tough year. We lost John Fitzpatrick. Michael Marburger is fortunately surviving, but had a tough, tough time recently, still has. And Yisrael Nissenkorn, my first fellow two years ago, had a stroke while visiting in Holland. And with trepidation, I went and had lunch with him and his family yesterday, and I was really dreading it. You know, it's difficult to see someone who can't communicate with you, but it was a, I left with a very good feeling. He's strong slowly, slowly uh, recovering, and uh, my heart obviously goes out, but it's, for those of you who live in Israel who had ties to him that have been a little bit concerned about, he definitely knew who I was, was excited I was there, so I would suggest if you have the time, it's a mitzvah to go and, and visit him, but again, life is, life is precious. Now, this is an easy topic for me uh, to talk about, because I think the TA low-grade tumor around the world, as far as I know, is way over-treated. And it's a little bit some, like uh, we're going to talk about active surveillance for prostate cancer, which I know is dear to Lori's uh, life. He's been writing about it, and, and certainly I'm a tag-along. But I think there are a lot of similarities in, in the sense. So this is what we're talking about, all of you who have some degree of pathology learning. No, right away, this is a low-grade uh, papillary tumor of the bladder. Now, an interesting point, and for those of you who have databases, I'm going to give you an interesting project, which I believe could be important. And that is, we analyzed recently, and we presented this in abstract. So far, it hasn't re reached publication. But as many of you know, before the ISUP grading change, their tumors were graded 1, 2, and 3. And in 2004, the ISUP suggested it should be low grade, high grade. So basically, most of the grade 2s and all of the grade 3s are called high grade, and grade 1 is low grade. Pun lump is very uh, infrequently diagnosed. Now, what I, th it increasingly was apparent to me that tumors that I would have said clinically as I observed them with the endoscope and, and remove them in the office or the OR, they are clearly to me a low-grade TA tumor, are coming back high-grade, grade two or grade three, because they're giving us both. And as you know, every guideline, so we say, oh, so what? What's the big deal? Well, the guidelines say if it's high-grade, for instance, you should consider BCG, for low grade, you should not use BCG. So that's clearly a guideline that's directed by the grade of the tumor. So what's my point? Well, over the years, I said, you know what? 
I think our pathologists, and they're urologic pathologists, they're very good pathologists. And they're all fellowship trained. And I said, you know, guys, I think you're overcalling these. And in fact, over uh, approximately eight years, I didn't show all the data, eight or nine years, it's gone from 40, 35 to 40 percent of all of the TURBTs being called grade one TA, I'm sorry, grade one, low grade, to only 10 percent. That is a very dramatic change, which now I have patients that, you know, 65 or 75 or 80 year old gentlemen. I, little papillary tumors, small tumors, easily resected, could be multiple, it doesn't matter. They're calling high grade. Now I have to think, do I have to give BCG? So the implications are important. So there, if you have a database, I would suggest, and you have go back 10 or 15 years, look at this, because I would like someone to do a very nice study and, and see if it can be confirmed. So as you, most of you know, although I was kidding Dr. Badlani just a week ago, still at the AUA, if you submit a abstract in the bladder cancer session, they call it superficial bladder cancer. I thought this term went out 100%. Non-muscle invasive bladder cancer really is not any better because in the whole area of TA and T1 tumors, we shouldn't use one term. It's ridiculous. It's like calling all prostate cancer, independent of grade, if you will, uh, like the low, intermediate, and high risk. It's not quite the same, but I think you get my message. A TA low grade has nothing to do with a high grade T1. So don't ever use the term superficial bladder cancer, and I try to avoid even non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So we know for many years the natural history of low grade TA, this is a non-lethal tumor. It's basically a benign papillary neoplasm of the urinary bladder if it's a low-grade TA tumor. And this goes back, again, Journal of Urology, 1978. Long-term follow-up, over 300 patients, all had essentially only a TUR, no intravescular therapy. And only 5% of these patients died of anything, and very few of urothelial carcinoma with a long follow-up. And we can update this. Here's an article from 2005 Journal of Urology, a large database, 23-year 23 23 mean follow-up, 115 grade one TA tumors, most of which are solitary in this population. Only one patient recurred after five years. Only 12% of those patients ever had a subsequent tumor, not the first tumor, but a subsequent tumor that progressed in, in greater stage, and only 3% ever became in their history, developed a T1 tumor. These are essentially benign neoplasms and not a single death related to bladder cancer. How accurate is flexible cystoscopy? Urologists, when they finish their training, are pretty damn good at saying this is a TA tumor and usually TA low grade. And this is a classic study by Harry Herr that was published. Bottom line, if you see at the bottom, when they ask the urologist, we're gonna compare what you say endoscopically, what your guess is compared to the pathology, 93% correct. Pretty good batting average. So why do we teach in the textbooks, you see a bladder tumor, take the patient to the OR or somehow remove it as you see it? Well, prevent or stop bleeding. But these little, when they're little, TA low-grade tumors rarely is the cause of hematuria when it's one, two, or three tumors. To determine the greater stage, I just told you, you're pretty accurate with your eye if with some experience. Remove tumor before they became lethal. These tumors don't become lethal. So if it's a small, low-grade TA tumor, do you have to remove it when you see it? And the benefit, of course, is obvious. Decreased visits to the OR, bad things when you go, happen when you go to the hospital between anesthesia, infection, avoiding symptoms, da 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 Avoid repeated trauma to the bladder. Rarely you're going to see someone require quality of life changes or even, as God forbid, a cystectomy from over-treatment for a tumor that would never have killed the patient. Reduce morbidity of the TUR and anesthesia, as I mentioned. So you could say in the first paper we wrote, what's the criteria for then doing something? Well, if the patient bleeds, that's rarely going to be the case. Significant growth, dramatic change in the growth, or now I'm worried it's a higher grade or the stage has changed. Well, actually, people usually say that the first article on this was the one I published in 2003, but I asked the question really, 
uh, many years, but actually almost 20 years before that, an article when I was at the University of Tennessee in Memphis, uh, surveillance of stage zero, which is the same as TA, grade one bladder cancer by site. Can you monitor them only by cytology? Why even scope the patient so frequently? Is it acceptable? And I gave the argument, as I eventually did put my, uh, my acumen, if you will, my thoughts actually in practice saying, okay, I'm just not gonna treat some of these patients and see what happened. And that was a result of that first paper on active surveillance for bladder tumors, which I, we look back at 32 patients, which I did just that. I didn't treat them. I said, you've got small little tumors. These are non-life threatening. We can just watch them. There's so little, there's no reason to do anything. And we showed that not a single patient uh, later developed a muscle invasive bladder tumor and rarely did they progress in any greater stage. And this is an example, 47-year-old man, the note that year 1992 was when he first uh, uh, saw me. His first tumor was in 1991, it was a low-grade TA, and in 99, low-grade tumor was fulgurated. He was noted to have these tumors, and these are, for example, the tumors, I he had had a radical prostatectomy, which I performed, mentioned that, uh, which has no relevance to the bladder tumors, actually. And you can see that uh, the top left is his normal left ureteral orifice, a teeny tumor exiting from the tip of the right ureteral orifice. And over time, we just monitored that for a while. And then cystos in the office, you can see one year, which I did absolutely nothing but observe these, little change. Then they would grow <laughs> a little bit more, and eventually I would either fulgurate them. And I am now very frequently do office fulguration. An interesting little anecdote, about two months ago, I asked one of our nurses before I left the University of Miami just uh, two months ago, I said, as I was fulgurating a tumor, I said, you know, by the way, I've never asked in the entire time, I've been here 20 years, and this nurse had been there at least six or seven, and now we had five urologic oncologists say, is anyone else doing this regularly, Cauterite? Dr. Soloway, you're the only one who does this in the office. I was absolutely floored. After all these years, I found out I was the only one in our group that would see these papillary tumors and fulgurate them in the office, which I do quite frequently and still do. So this patient who I just mentioned, now it's 2014, so I mentioned first tumors 1992, and he had a right distal ureterectomy during this time, 23 year follow-up, still has occasional little papillary tumors, that's it. And, but that's the usual, this is not a rare, rare patient. Now, again, watchful waiting and recurrent tumors, the, Second article published in 2005, just shortly after uh, the article I wrote, was right here in Israel uh, by Dr. Ofrit et al. published in European Urology, 28 patients, et cetera. Same thing, all TA at removal, no greater stage progression. This is another article, 2009, 64 patients this time. Bottom line, no patient ever developed in this group muscle invasive bladder cancer. This is now, fast forward, this year's AUA abstract from Barcelona. Uh, patients who were monitored with low-grade TA offered active surveillance beginning 2006, flexible cysto every six months, 68 patients, and again, mean follow-up of two years. 50% eventually in their time frame had a TUR of the bladder tumor, 22% were PTA uh, to PT, PT1A or grade increase, none developed a muscle invasive plan. And they have a wonderful database in Barcelona at the Fondacion Pujver. Now, okay, if you take, do take these patients, just parenthetically, to the OR, I strongly suggest the safest way is not with a resectoscope, cold cut biopsy, and fulguration. I think, in my experience, least chance of perforation, particularly someone who might have a thin bladder. So I try to avoid a loop resection in these patients. This didn't come out so well. That was a recent case. What about fluorescent cystoscopy? As long as I have a couple, few minutes of time just to mention it. Fluorescent cystoscopy, I think, has its place. I'm not sure exactly what it is. I wouldn't change all my instruments. In the US, you may or may not know that it's required by the FDA approval to use Stortz equipment. So if you happen to use Olympus, which I've mainly used, then uh, it's not available. Do I think you should rush and get it just because of that? The answer would probably be no. It does increase the likelihood that you will not miss a papillary tumor, but there are other ways you can accomplish the same thing. Cytology will help. This is with narrowband imaging. It accomplishes, looks almost exactly the same thing, and this, all the companies have narrowband imaging, so it's an alternative if you don't 
use uh, installation of HexFix or SysU or 5HLA, as it would be called generically. So the NVI gives you the same benefit. Um, just a word, post-op intravesical therapy is now part of all of the guidelines. I think it's important. It's underused in North America for a variety of reasons. Uh, the EAU guidelines uh, committee certainly suggests, this is Wim Osterling, all arguments are in favor of an immediate installation of all with papillary TA and T1 tumors, including intermittent high risk, of the exact benefit is not clear, the extent of the benefit, but all would agree it should be used. So when I fulgurate these tumors in the office, I often will put in 20 or 40 milligrams of mitomycin C. So in short, to me, it's a no-brainer. Um, it's interesting, though, how infrequent and how things are different across the world. In Australia, I've had several fellows from Australia and New Zealand. In Australia, no urologist has a flexible cystoscope in their office. All patients every TURBT is done, or any removal, even diagnostic part of it, is done in the hospital, which to me makes absolutely no sense except for the way the economic system is. But if I were the dictator running their National Health Service, I would certainly figure out some way you don't have to take every patient to the hospital. So active surveillance isn't even a possibility because they don't even do flexi-cystos in their office. In contrast, last week I was in Guy's Hospital, and, and they have a bladder tumor group, which is fantastic, the way they centralize there. And they go through their whole list of bladder tumor patients for that day in the, in the rooms, as you will, in the clinic. And they segregate patients very well into low risk, high risk, low risk, bring them back in six or eight or nine months. A lot of these are elderly patients, been in the NIH roles for many years. So they do follow this uh, uh, segregation into patients. So how people are managed around the world is dramatically different, even though we all know the information. So the bottom line is, don't overtreat low-grade TA tumors. They are benign. People say, well, the patient wants it out. I have had no trouble in convincing patients that, look, these are two little teeny tumors. We don't need to do anything. Or, okay, we can cauterize them in, in the office. I don't think that's an excuse because the patient wants it, because usually we don't give the patient the uh, correct alternatives. And again, it's great to be here. Thanks for your attention.